attendees mute themselves for the duration of the lectures. We encourage you all to ask questions during the lectures, but please do so in the chat. One of the organizers will communicate your questions to the instructor. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions verbally at the end of each lecture. With that being said, we're very happy to have Sahana Bayasubramania speaking on ASI Indurke and relatively hyperplate groups for uh, last lecture. Uh, whenever you're ready, Sahana. Thanks, Macarena. So for today, I'm going to focus on uh, one more advanced topic that uh, lives in this world of asymmetrical hyperbolicity, and that's this topic of group theoretic uh, Dane sieving. And this really draws inspiration from the phenomenon which is known as Dane surgery on three manifolds. So let me first explain what this is, and then I'll jump into the analog of this, which is the group theoretic Dane filling uh, process. So what is, what is Dane surgery on three manifolds? Well, what you do is you take a three manifold and the surgery consists of two parts of the operation. There is the cutting, which is the first part, and then there is the gluing, which is the second part. So in the first part of this process, what you do is that you have your three manifold and you cut out a solid torus from it. And you can think of this as also drilling inside your three manifold along this embedded uh, circle. And what this does is give you a three manifold with a toroidal boundary. And now what I'd like to do is glue back in a solid torus, but I don't want to glue it back in the way I cut it out. I'd like to glue it back in in a slightly different way. And the broad question in this field is, what does this do to your manifold? Because you've altered it using this, this Dane surgery, right? So formally, what does this mean? Formally, uh, I'm going to let N be a compact orientable three manifold. And from this three manifold, I cut out a solid torus. And what this gives me is still a compact orientable three manifold with a toroidal boundary, which I'll denote by the boundary of M, uh, which perhaps I should make this an M prime and instead make this a manifold. Okay. And now what do I do? Well, I have this solid torus that I'd like to glue back in. And the way I'm going to glue back in is by choosing some uh, essential simple closed curve on my solid torus, uh, rather on my on my torus. Uh, and there are lots of such curves on a, on a torus, as you may imagine. And these curves are often identified up to homotopy. So after homotopy equivalence, we, we talk about the existence of such a curve. So I, I pick an unoriented essential simple closed curve in this toroidal boundary and I'm going to call this simple closed curve S uh, because these are often called slopes. And you may wonder why is a curve being called a slope? That's because of the following uh, reason. When you have a torus, its fundamental group is essentially Z cross Z. And you know this is, you, you can do this yourself even sitting at home. It's this neat little process. Uh, if you took a rectangular piece of paper um, and you drew a line across it, right? And you think of this rectangular piece of paper as being a representation of Z cos Z. And you have a line in this paper, which represents, which is of course identifiable by some particular slope running through the origin. 
And then you do to this paper what one does in order to identify the sides of a rectangle to create a torus. Right? So you would have the top and the bottom edges, and you would wrap them around to glue them. And this would give you a cylinder with two open circles on the side. And then you would take those and you would glue those together. And then what you would see is that this line that you had marked in your plane to start with has now been mapped to this closed, essential simple closed curve. Right, so ascension means you're not homotopic to a point. Uh, simple means that you don't self-intersect and closed just means that you're closed. So that's where the inspiration to call such a curve a slope comes from. And what do I do? Um, associated to S, the Dane filling of M, which is denoted M of S, uh, is the manifold which is obtained by attaching a solid torus, which is the disk cross a circle uh, to your boundary, but in a very specific way, I'm going to glue in this solid torus so that the meridian curve of the boundary of the disk gets mapped to the curve S, which is in the boundary of your manifold, right? And if you're wondering about what this meridian curve is, well, if you imagine that this is your solid torus, then the meridian curve is the one which represents the boundary of the disk is the curve that looks like this, right? Because that's the boundary of your disk and having taken it cross with the circle is what gives you your solid torus. So this is what is formally known as Dane surgery. And there is a very famous theorem by Thurston which tells you under certain conditions what this process of Dane surgery results in. So the theorem of Thurston says, let M be a compact orientable three manifold with toroidal boundary And the statement claims that if M modulo its boundary admits a finite volume hyperbolic structure, so provide you, provided you have this hyperbolic structure modulo the boundary to start with, the Dane filling that you get of this manifold with respect to this choice of curve S, this is a hyperbolic manifold for all but finitely many choices of S. So provided you have a nice enough structure to begin with, when you do this sort of gluing back in, you will get back something that is a genuinely hyperbolic manifold. And this is true almost assuredly, except for finitely many slopes. This is definitely going to happen. And now what we want to do is construct sort of the group theoretic analog of this. And here's one way where you can start thinking about how this could possibly be transferable into group theory. Well, what you would do is this you would consider G to be the fundamental group of your manifold, where this is the manifold which has um, the toroidal boundary and is compact and orientable. And I'm going to consider the subgroup H of G, um, which is represented by the fundamental group of the boundary, which as we know is isomorphic to Z cos Z. 
And then given an element S in H, I do the following. I take G modulo the normal subgroup that's generated by S. So I'm going to use these double brackets for uh, the normal subgroup generated. And what the Seifert van van Kampen theorem tells us is the following. This tells us that if you consider the fundamental group of the Dane theoretic of the Dane filling of your manifold with respect to S, this is actually going to be equal to G modulo this normal subgroup. Right? And this is essentially, therefore, the algebraic counterpart of MS. But we can do something actually even more powerful which was the work that was done by Dahmani, Gerardel, and Osin. And what they did was show that the analog of Thurston's theorem holds for the pair Hg, where H is not just a subgroup, but is in fact a hyperbolically embedded subgroup of G. And what I'm going to do is draw a nice little table that will show you how the machinery passes from the world of three manifolds to the world of groups. And then I'll go on to actually state the theorem. So here's the world of three manifolds. And on the other side, I'm going to talk about how this transfers to groups. So what do we start with in the case of three manifolds? We start with a compact, orientable, three manifold M. And on the other side, I just start with a group G. And here I have this boundary delta m and on this side i have a subgroup h of g and remember thurston's theorem has this condition that m modulo the boundary admits a finite volume <clears throat> hyperbolic structure and that assumption in the group theoretic world turns into H being hyperbolically embedded into G, because remember, this condition of being hyperbolically embedded comes with the choice of a relative generating set uh, with respect to which this Cayley graph is hyperbolic. So that's why this is the correct analog of this setting from the three manifold group, because here you're sort of ignoring the boundary. And in this Cayley graph, you collapsed your entire subgroup H. So you're sort of ignoring what H contributes to this Cayley graph, because it, its complete subgraph is QI to a point out here. And then over here, when you have a choice of a slope S, here we have a choice of an element S in H. And of course, the last analog is that here you have the Dane filling of M with respect to this slope S. And over here, you get the group G modulo the normal subgroup generated by this S. Okay. So what is the actual statement of the theorem? It is as follows, and it is a bit long, but bear with me. So let G be a group. and H a subgroup of G such that H hyperbolically embeds into G with respect to X for some subset X of G. Then there exists a finite subset 
f uh, consisting of non-trivial elements of h such that for every normal subgroup that you could take an H. So now the statement is a bit more general than just considering the normal closure of single elements. It can be stated in terms of any normal subgroup. Uh, so such that for all normal subgroups of H, uh, which do not contain uh, an element of F, the following holds. And what are these conditions? Well, the first one is that if G is asymmetrically hyperbolic, then so is G quotiented by the normal group generated by N, where, remember, this is the normal subgroup generated by N, but this is the normal subgroup generated by N in G. So I'm gonna add this little subscript G because of course N is normal in H, but we're talking about its larger normal closure in the entire group. Uh, the second condition is that H intersected with this normal closure is exactly N. Uh, the other way to think of this would be that if you take the map, the natural map, from H quotiented by N into this group, G quotiented by the normal closure of N, uh, this map would be injective. The third condition is that H modulo N actually hyperbolically embeds into this group. And what is the relative generating set? Well, it's going to be X bar where x bar is the image of x in our quotient group. And lastly, which is a criterion on the structure of this normal subgroup generated by n, we can say something very, very strong about it. This group is the free product of conjugates of n in G. And moreover, every element of this group is, uh, right, is either conjugate to an element of n or it acts loxodromically on this Cayley graph that we started with. So that's the analog. And you can see that, you know, where we, in the, in the geometric component, when we had these exceptional cases of finitely many slopes that don't give you a hyperbolic manifold, you have something very similar here where there's this finite set of elements that you have to avoid in order to recover that hyperbolic, uh, in order to recover the property of being hyperbolic, which of course comes because you have a proper infinite non-degenerate hyperbolically embedded subgroup in here. Okay, and this theorem also has a really nice corollary to the world of relatively hyperbolic groups, because as we've seen, the concept of the peripheral subgroups from the relatively hyperbolic world is generalized by the concept of the hyperbolically embedded subgroups from the acylindrical world. So the corollary is that let G be hyperbolic uh, relative to H which is, of course, not the entire group because we don't want to do something trivial, then for any subgroup 
n, which is normal in H, avoiding a fixed finite set of non-trivial elements uh, we have that H intersected with the normal closure in G is just N. So once again, you recover this property that the natural map from H mod N into G mod the normal closure of N is an injected map. Uh, and moreover, we can say that this group is hyperbolic relative to H modulo N. And of course, the reason is because if G was hyperbolic relative to H, remember that's just the same as being hyperbolically embedded, but you know that this relative generating set is always finite. And we already know that H mod N hyperbolically embeds into this group with respect to X bar. So then what's X bar? It's just the image of X. And if X was finite, then of course its image in this quotient is also going to be finite. And that's what gives you the relative hyperbolicity over here. And you know, in this case, you can also say something more. You can say that if G is not virtually cyclic, then neither is its quotient by the normal subgroup that we've quotiented it out by. And now this machinery, right? I've, I've given you a lot of statements. I've given you sort of the group theoretic analog of something that was completely geometric. Uh, and you know, the interest in doing this was not just academic. There are some very, very powerful applications of this theory. So I'm going to talk about those next. And, you know, it would be impossible for me to cover all of the applications of Dane filling that are present in the literature, but I'm going to talk about what I believe are some of the more popular or some of the more famous examples and hopefully that will uh, pique your interest. So the first application that I'm going to talk about um, is actually the application of the virtual Hawking conjecture. Which of course uh, was finally proved due to by, e by Ian Agel. Um, and if you don't know what the virtual Hawking conjecture is, uh, I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it, but informally this conjecture says that if you have a compact oriented irreducible three manifold and it has an infinite fundamental group then it's fundamental then then the manifold itself is virtually hawken and what does that mean it means it has a finite cover which is a hawken manifold and if you don't know what a hawken manifold is that's okay but it is a very specific kind of compact irreducible manifold so that's what the virtual hawken conjecture is and Following Perelman's proof of the geometrization conjecture, the conjecture was open only for hyperbolic manifolds. And that is what Ian Nagel did. And this very much uses the Dane filling theory. And where do you do this sort of Dane filling uh, process? You, you do it in relatively hyperbolic groups. Uh, and you also use some of the work that was uh, done by Danny Weiss, Groves, and Daniel Groves and Jason Matting. So that's what went into the proof of this virtual Hawking conjecture. The second big application that I am aware of is in solving the isomorphism problem. for relatively hyperbolic groups, um, but not all relatively hyperbolic groups, but those with 
residually finite peripheral subgroups uh, under some additional assumptions, uh, which I just don't want to get into for the purpose of explaining uh, the application. So what is what goes into uh, solving this isomorphism problem? Well, actually, you use the corollary above. And where do you apply the corollary? You end up applying it to the finite index normal subgroups uh, of the peripheral subgroups. Um, okay, so first of all, if you don't know what residually finite means, um, it is a property of a group so that if you pick your favorite element in the group, there is always a homomorphism into some finite group so that your favorite element survives this homomorphism. So there is some homomorphism to a finite group so that your favorite element does not get mapped to the identity. Uh, and it is for this reason that residually finite groups are also said to be finitely approximable because this condition allows you to approximate the group using finite groups. And you know that property of being residually finite sort of plays really well with this property that you want to avoid a finite set of subgroups uh, when you're considering this uh, group theoretic analog of the Dean filling. And you know what this application to the normal subgroups of peripheral subgroups does is that it yields an approximation. Uh, of such a relatively hyperbolic group by hyperbolic groups. And once you can do this, then you can use the what is known about the isomorphism problem for hyperbolic groups. Um, and that was, I think, done by the Hamani and, and Girardel. So that's what went into solving uh, this particular problem. The third application that I can think of was studying the residual finiteness of outer automorphism groups. So what's the what's a quick overview of what is known in this world? Uh, well, Minassian, Ashot Minassian and Dennis Dosin did the following. Uh, they were able to show that out G is residually finite. Uh, if G is residually finite with infinitely many n's, and this process again uses Dane filling in relatively hyperbolic groups. And then after this work was done, uh, Yago Antelin, Ashot Minassian, and Alessandro Sisto did the following. They showed that mapping class groups of certain Hawking three manifolds are residually finite. And they again use some of the tools and techniques that we've talked about in this mini course, but in particular, the fact that, you know, these mapping class groups are asymmetrically hyperbolic and the fundamental groups of these uh, three manifolds are asymmetrically hyperbolic plays a crucial role uh, in their proof. And the last application that I think is interesting um, is the Farrell-Jones conjecture. Or uh, relatively hyperbolic groups. 
So if you don't know what the Farrell-Jones conjecture is, um, again, I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it, but very simply put, uh, there are certain assembly maps that arise from homologic, that arise homologically, so they arise in this homology setting. And the conjecture states that those assembly maps are actually an isomorphism. So they're very, they have this rigid structure on them. And um, what Arthur Bartles was able to show um, was that the class of groups that satisfy this conjecture uh, is stable under relative hyperbolicity. So what does that mean? It means if you've got a group and it's hyperbolic relative a peripheral subgroup, if you know that the peripheral subgroup satisfies the Farrell-Jones conjecture, then the parent group does as well. But Arthur Bartle's proof did not use any of the machinery that we've discussed. However, there is a particular case of this conjecture uh, where the peripherals are residually finite. Uh, which was uh, done by Yago Antelin, Remy Coulon, and Gandini. And this particular case that they've showed, uh, you know, has the same property of being stable under relative hyperbolicity. Um, this uses uh, Dane Filling's in order to prove. So even though the conjecture in this generality did not use the tools, there are certainly other cases where there are some conditions imposed on the peripherals and then the proof in those cases actually does go via this process of Dane fillings. So hopefully that convinces you that these tools of group theoretic Dane filling and you know, hyperbolically embedded subgroups are these very powerful tools that, uh, that are very useful. And what I'd like to do for the remaining time that I have left today is to talk a little bit about my own research. Um, I tend to work not directly in this world, but I tend to work in a related area of cylindricity. Uh, but I do, I do wanna talk about that. Um, so what do I do? Well, I am a geometric group theorist. Uh, and what I like to do is study actions on hyperbolic spaces. And, you know, there's a very canonical, canonical way to do this. Uh, if you have a group G, you can always turn it into a metric space by taking its Cayley graph with respect to some generating set S. And the group always have a, has a very nice action on the space, which is of course uh, co-bounded. And what I'm interested in knowing is under what conditions imposed on this generating set S, uh, do I actually get something that's hyperbolic? And why do I want to do this? Well, the broader goal that I have in my head is that I would like to understand, uh, given a group G, understand all possible group actions uh, on some hyperbolic space. And in general, this goal is really hard to achieve. And the reason is there are these construction, constructions by Groves and Manning, uh, which are these 
you know, which allows you to put a combinatorial horror ball on your group. And when you do that, the resulting space is hyperbolic and the group has a parabolic action on this space. And there is a way to do this so that you can get infinitely many actions and they're all sort of inequivalent to one another. Uh, in the sense that if I want to see the dynamics of one action in one of these other actions, I won't be able to. So those actions are all inequivalent and there are infinitely many of them. However, what we do know is that parabolic actions are never co-bounded. And therefore, I'd like to simplify my task and give myself a more realistic goal of trying to understand, okay, um, what about G actions on hyperbolic spaces, which are in fact co-bounded? so that I don't have to worry about this large, large class of parabolic actions. And the answer is, well, this can still be extremely complicated. And this is kind of where acylindrical hyperbolicity comes in, because what's known, what, what is a result, which was done by Carolyn Abbott, me and Dennis Osen, is that uh, if G is acylindrically hyperbolic, then there exist uh, infinitely many inequivalent actions of a group G on a space X, uh, where X is hyperbolic and the action is co-bounded. And not just infinitely many, actually you can make this uncountably many. And this kind of makes the problem really intractable for even well understood groups, because as we know, uh, the class of acylindrically hyperbolics is so, of groups is so large, it contains so many other well known examples which have been extensively studied in history. And even for those well understood groups, something this wild is happening, that you have just so many actions that you could study. And in fact, not only can you make these co-bounded on some hyperbolic space, you can also make them non-elementary. And in particular, uh, if, uh, if G is hyperbolic, so non-elementary hyperbolic, Uh, we can produce uh, lots of examples that are uh, rather, let me say, if G is the free group, um, and in particular Fn, uh, we can produce examples that are purely loxodromic. So what does purely loxodromic mean? Purely loxodromic means every non-identity element will act as a loxodromic element in this action. And you know the popular example for a purely loxodromic action is when F2 acts on its standard Cayley graph, which is a valence or tree. Every non-identity element is a, a loxodromic in that action. But in this case, you know, that's not the only action which is purely loxodromic. We can produce an infinite set of such actions which are all inequivalent and where every non-identity element is still a loxodromic. So the set of loxodromics does not in particular identify our, our action. So this is really, really wild behavior which makes it sort of in intractable in order to try and understand. And so one might ask ourselves, okay, what if we try to avoid this sort of wild behavior? Then, you know, the obvious solution is to try and focus on some well-behaved class of groups. And so what we do is that we attempt to focus on solvable groups. Can we do this for solvable groups? Because solvable groups will not have Three subgroups, therefore, they won't have these non-elementary type actions. And then the question is, can we still classify 
all of the co-bounded actions on some hyperbolic space given a solvable group. And what we know so far is that for certain specific groups inside the world of solvable groups, this is, this is doable. So one example, which was, which was done by me, is, is G is the lamplighter group. And that's the group which is uh, Zn with Z. Or if you like thinking about groups in terms of uh, semi-direct products, you can think of this as the direct sum of infinitely many copies of Zn, which is acted on by, by an infinite cyclic group. And what does how can you visualize this base group? Well, you visualize it as uh, an infinite tuple of elements where only finitely many entries have non-zero entry. And what does the generator of P do? It takes the tuple and shifts every space one step to the right. And the action of T inverse takes this tuple and puts everything one step to the left. And for this group, we can actually answer the question, what are all the co-bounded actions of a group on some hyperbolic space? Uh, this is what those actions look like. And in fact, you can arrange them in a poset. So you always have uh, the action, which is, you know, the action on a point. And above that, you have an action on a line. And where does this action comes from? come from? Uh, it comes by projecting the group to its z factor. So you you sort of ignore this uh, part of the group and you just act by the z copy of it. Um, and it is known that you know this is of course an elliptic action. If I follow Gromo's terminology, and the this action on the line is is lineal. And then you have an entire class of groups. So I'm actually going to draw it in a slightly different color because this isn't going to be one action. This is going to be a class of them. And all of these actions that are sitting up here are quasi-parabolic. So I did not talk about what quasi-parabolic actions were, because these, of course, don't show up in the world of acylindricity. Um, but quasi-parabolic basically means that your group acts with unbounded orbits. You have infinitely many loxodromics, but all of the loxodromic elements have one common point on the Romo boundary, which they all share. So that means that when your entire group is acting on the space, there's this one global fixed point on the boundary of your hyperbolic space, which is fixed under the action of the entire group. And this is very different from the general type action that we've discussed for acylindrical actions, because there, there are no global fixed points on the boundary of your hyperbolic space, which is why you get those transverse loxodromies. But here, they're not transverse all of them have this one common fixed point uh, on the boundary. And you may wonder what these actions are that sit over here. Well, first of all, um, S sub Zn is the subgroups of Zn. Uh, which are, of course, ordered by uh, inclusion. And this, as we know, is also a poset. And basically associated to every proper subgroup of Zn, I have an action, which is actually equivalent to the action on a tree, um, which is sitting inside this poset. And I don't just have one copy of this poset, I have two copies of the poset. So these are associated to actions on trees, which are actually Basser trees. Um, and you may wonder, where, where do these actions come from? Well, they come from the following setting. Remember what I said about that base group of this group is that it looks like the set of all infinite tuples where only finitely many elements have a non-zero entry. Well, what I can do is establish tuples that have a very specific form. Uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to 
uh, take my infinite tuple. I'm going to think of it as And let's say this is the position that's marked by zero. And therefore, of course, this is the position marked by one, two, and so on. And similarly to the other end. And what I'm going to do is that I'm only going to allow elements where at the zero position all the way to positive infinity, I allow uh, any coefficient from my group here, my full group Zn here. But then for a particular choice of subgroup H of Zn, I only allow coefficients from H to exist on the indices that are marked by negative integers. And of course, you can take this picture and you can flip it completely about the origin. And that would give you another structure associated to H where all of the coefficients on the negative indices now can be anything you want them but everything on the positive indices has to have a coefficient or an entry that's restricted to this subgroup. And these two structures are sort of incompatible with each other, right? Why is that? It's because if you act by the right shift on such a tuple, this is fine because, you know, the entry, the element of H can be mapped into the larger group. But you can't go backwards because if there is an entry here that doesn't belong to your subgroup H, the left shift is not going to respect the entry into this into this subgroup. And the converse is true for the structure that that's flipped uh, the other way around. That's compatible with the left shift, but not the right shift. And so this results in a structure that gives you an ascending H and N extension, and that H and N extension, of course, results in an action on a Bostek tree. So that's what we know about lamplighter groups. And there was another class of examples that were done, which were the solvable Bumsog solitar groups. And this was done by Harlan Abbott and Alex Rasmussen. And what they show is the following. Um, so let's assume that um, N decomposes as the product of K primes in its prime decomposition, and then all of its co-bounded actions on hyperbolic spaces are the following. Uh, you have the action on a point, of course, and sitting above this is an action on a line where, of course, this is again an elliptic action and this is a lineal action. And you may wonder where this lineal action comes from. Well, actually, BS1N also has the structure of a semi-direct product. This, this, this group is Z adjoint 1 over N acted on by, let me write it this way, acted on by Z, where what does the generator of Z do? It, takes the element in Z adjoint 1 over N and multiplies it by N. That's, that's what it does. It's multiplication by N. And of course, all of its powers. So the lineal action, again, just comes from projecting to this factor, this Z copy that's sitting inside your group. And now sitting above this is many, many quasi-parabolic actions. Uh, there is an action, which is the action on the hyperbolic plane. And then you have an action where you have the action, the standard action of this group on its Bastard tree. And then you have this large coset that's, that's sitting in here. And what is this coset? This is an isomorphic copy of 2 to the 1 to k. So it's the power set of the, the number of primes that you have from the prime decomposition of N. And where did these actions come from? Well, first of all, because of the way I've drawn it, this one is the largest action inside the sub set, which means every other action over here comes from a quotient of this action. So these are all quasi-parabolic.
and also actions on trees. And how do you quotient your vast set tree? Well, you pick a particular prime from this set of primes. And then if you choose to collapse along that particular prime, uh, that collapsing gives you a quotient of this tree, which then results in this process. So we understand um, how to deal with these cases. And something that Stymie does for a long time was you know, both of these groups have the structure of being a semi-direct product times Z. And we didn't really understand what do you do if instead you've got Z to the N where N is at least two. Uh, this is much harder to do because, you know, you have a very, very non-hyperbolic group, which is, which is now acting on your base group. And you may wonder, you know, you can't do the usual thing of just projecting to this group. That's, that's not going to work, not all the time. But this is where our current work comes in. What we're trying to do is trying to uh, develop machinery uh, to study the actions of such groups. And actually what we do uh, is to is that we're trying to generalize the notion of a confining subset, which is sort of characteristic of having a quasi-parabolic action. So the original notion of a confining subset was, de was defined by Cornulier, Capras, Nicolas Monod, and Tessera. And unfortunately, their work, again, only applies in the situation when you have h r times z. And what we're trying to do is try to bump up the dimension. And it turns out you can actually generalize that theory to this higher dimensional case. And that actually allows us to study the quasi-parabolic actions of these this more uh, general class of groups. So we're currently writing up our paper, and hopefully it should it should be out in, in maybe the next um, month or so, but, but this is what I do, though rather this is the direction in which my current research is skewed. I, I try to understand all the different possible actions of the group on some hyperbolic space, and by arranging them in this post set, I'm hoping to understand in particular, you know, which are the best actions to study given a particular group, because why consider some general action if, say, all of the information about all of these actions is encoded in this one, and then I might as well study this one and just the one on the hyperbolic plane. Or, for example, here, I can choose, you know, the, the proper subgroup uh, of Zn, which is perhaps one of the largest in these subposets, and then just choose to study, choose to study those. So part of my goal in doing this is also to understand what is the best action which could be useful for studying a group? Maybe there, and sometimes there is an answer. Like for cylindrical actions, we do know for a mapping class group, the action on the curve graph is the largest. And for rags, the action on the extension graph is the largest. And for fundamental groups of three manifolds, it's the action on the bus there tree. So there are very strong things that we can say even for large classes of groups in this, in this setting. Which is, which is what makes it interesting for